Hey everybody, this is Frank Quinn from Heritage Ohio, and welcome to the third in our Profiles in Preservation, Preservation Month webinar series. Today we are joining you uh, high atop the downtown Toledo skyline, and it's a wonderful view. We're in the offices of CT Consultants, and today we are looking at preservation consulting. We have a special guest who I think you're going to enjoy learning a little bit more about over the course of the next hour. We have Maura Johnson from Mannix Smith Group, and she is going to talk all about the ins and outs of preservation consulting and what she's experienced in her career. So I'm excited to have Maura on my right, and I am also excited to have Danielle Steinhauser on my left. She is a, um, what is your official job title? Community Development Specialist. She is a Community Development Specialist with CT Consultants, and Danielle has been a friend of Heritage Ohio for many years. So uh, Danielle is going to um, help us out the second part of the webinar with some discussion. Uh, but at this point, uh, from a tech standpoint, you may or may not know that I am cursed, so um, I have Pearl, Pearl with us today to make sure everything goes well on the IT uh, end of things. So feel free to ask questions. We want this to be a bit of a dialogue uh, between you and us towards the end of it. So ask any questions you have into the question box. We'll take a look at them uh, at the end of Maura's presentation. If you have any tech issues with the webinar connection, a lot of times that can be um, helped or uh, resolved if you just log out and try logging back in. So um, I guess that takes care of things. And so without further ado, I will turn it over to Maura. Oh, wait a minute. You're probably like, but what's Heritage Ohio? And so I need to tell you about our mission to help people save the places that matter, build community, and live better. So uh, very much into the historic preservation and into the downtown revitalization aspect of our work. We are the state coordinator with the Ohio Main Street program, and we work in partnership with the National Main Street Center out of Chicago. So we do a lot of cool stuff. We're doing cool stuff for Preservation Month and then the other 11 months out of the year also. And that's our pretty logo and whatnot. But okay, now I will turn it over to Maura to talk a little bit more. And this looks very interesting. <laughs> uh, a good first slide. Thanks, Frank, and thanks for having me here today. I'm really flattered to be invited to be a speaker on the subject of uh, preservation consulting. I have a long history of well, consulting and working actually in public sector and private sector uh, and working as a, an independent contractor. So uh, I'm going to start this presentation with some biographical stuff to tell you something about what my talents are and how I actually built a, a career in historic preservation. First of all, I was born uh, in 1953 in New York City. Um, my dad was an architect, and at the time I was born, worked uh, for a firm in Manhattan. My mom was a secretary there, and here's a clipping from the, uh, the company newsletter. This was taped into my baby book with dad's markups, so the die was cast, I think. Um, we moved to Manhattan from we moved from Manhattan to Chatham Township, New Jersey, in North Central Jersey, when I was uh, one year old. Here I am at Easter time. Uh, that's me in the middle with the gloves. I think I'd lost some teeth shortly before. Uh, my mom is a picture of mid-century chic, and it's my dad there who uh, the architect who most influenced my career path. He's hiding a cigarette in his bottom left hand. Uh, I started college in New London, Connecticut as a French major. I spent my junior year at the Institute of European Studies in Nantes, which is an industrial city on the Loire River near the western coast of France. I lived with a French couple that year and an American roommate. Honestly, classes weren't terribly rigorous, so I traveled as much and as far as I could afford to with a URL pass that year. 
my senior year back in Connecticut, I'd switched to an art major, but took lots of art history classes. I vividly remember an encouraging comment on a Renaissance architecture exam, which took me a little by surprise. Although I have a good sense of volume and space, I'm really good at packing a car. I was more into two-dimensional artwork than three-dimensional art. After graduation, I worked for three years in the restaurant business as a cook in several East Coast locations. One summer on Martha's Vineyard, I picked up a book called America's Forgotten Architecture, which was published by the National Trust in 1976. It's the first I'd heard about historic preservation, and for me, it was sort of an epiphany. A friend of mine was teaching in upstate New York, so in 1981, I moved to Ithaca to look for work. I loved it there, but after a year's work in a printing press, decided it was time to get serious about a career. Right there in Ithaca, Cornell University has a school of hotel management and in the School of Architecture, a historic preservation program. Weighing the two, I chose preservation. In addition to the standard coursework in architectural and history and planning, I learned to do measured drawings, take photos with a large format camera, the kind with the hood over your head, and process and print film. I especially like vernacular building types, and my thesis was on the history of the mobile home industry. Putting that knowledge of mobile homes to work, I spent the summer after graduation as an intern with the County Cooperative Extension Office to create a mobile home weatherization program, a traveling program. From New York, I, I moved to Eugene, Oregon, where I purchased and rehabbed a 1928 bungalow with my friend Jeff. The University of Oregon is located in Eugene, and they have an excellent historic preservation program. So finding my first postgraduate job in the field was really a challenge and possibly even kind of stupid on my part. I volunteered a bunch, worked on a countywide cultural landscape survey, and wrote a small grant for the County Historical Museum to create a preservation resource center there. I prepared house histories, wrote local landmark nomination, and was contracted by the city planning department to prepare a historic preservation component of a comprehensive neighborhood plan. Uh, I also coordinated Preservation Week activities one year, which was a total blast. During that time, I also took several classes at a local community college in blueprint reading, finished construction, and real estate. But I really needed a full-time job. So in 1990, I accepted a position as Community Development Coordinator for the City of Liberty, Missouri, which is just outside Kansas City. I administered the city's certified local government program, staffed the Historic District Commission, coordinated downtown events and activities, and worked to enhance and promote Liberty's historic districts. Working in local government was a real personal challenge for me. So three years later, under a grant from the State Department of Natural Resources, I was hired by the Missouri Route 66 Association to conduct an architectural survey of Route 66 in several counties across the state. Uh, that was one of my all-time favorite jobs. But by the end of that project, I was again looking for a full-time job and was hired in 1995 as the Northwest Regional Coordinator for the Ohio Historic Preservation Office. In that capacity, I provided technical assistance to communities, organizations, and individuals in a 19-county region in Northwest Ohio. For eight years, I also taught uh, part-time at BGSU in the construction technology and pop culture departments. Our class projects were all about community service. And here I am with the staff. I was embedded uh, at the Center for at BGSU Center for Archival Collections, and that's the archive staff there. And two of my interns, actually, um, Matt Carlosi and and Ben. I can't remember his name. Sorry, Ben. Uh, with the closure of the regional offices in 1999, I came to work for the Mannequin Smith Group. Now, Mannequin Smith is a civil engineering survey and environmental consulting firm. Uh, the company was started in 1995. Um, they have five offices now in Ohio. We have seven in Michigan, and there's about 300 employees with the company. Um, the cultural resources group that I manage uh, consists of one historian, a PhD historian and archeologist, uh, and two uh, field techs, uh, field supervisors, and one historian. So it's a small team. Uh, Chris Owen, who is a graduate of EMU's Historic Preservation Program, 
uh, came to Mannequin Smith uh, just within the last couple of years, and he's working almost exclusively on NEPA projects associated with transportation. So uh, we're a small group. Uh, I call it the best kept secret at Mannequin Smith because the engineers hardly know what we do. Um, but as a civil engineering firm, obviously a lot of the work that Mannequin Smith does is transportation related. Um, so let me go through a couple of projects and show you what's typical for me. Um, one project, for instance, involved the replacement of some bridges at Elizabeth Park in Trenton, Michigan. Um, you can see the deterioration of the bridge, which uh, it's a very popular destination for uh, wedding photos. But um, the deterioration was so bad that we were hired to replace the bridges. And as part of that, I had to do some documentation. So the, the project involved taking photographs of the building, uh, sorry, of the structure and uh, doing some research, which served as uh, documentation or mitigation for the, the loss of those uh, historic structures. Um, we also, most of the work at Mannequin Smith is compliance driven. That is uh, under the requirements of the National Historic Preservation Act, any federal assistance or permitting uh, requires that you consider impacts to historic resources. Um, and one of the large projects we're working on right now was uh, triggered by a core permit um, in Hancock County, um, where there's a large flood mitigation project under consideration right now. And as they look at alternatives, we're doing architectural survey and archeological work in those areas that might be impacted either by uh, redirecting the river, widening river corridor, corridor or uh, making any kind of land changes. So uh, that involves actually going out and doing architectural survey within the area of direct impact and also within the area that may be indirectly impacted. Um, a federal agency may, uh, under Section 110, uh, is required to do um, management and planning for their historic resources. And several years ago, uh, we worked for the Michigan Department of Military and Veterans Affairs uh, to survey Michigan armories uh, constructed between 1957 and 62 in that state. So we were exposed to some mid-century architecture. Also for the National Guard, we did some documentation at Camp Perry. These are the hutments that served as POW quarters uh, at Camp Perry. Um, in addition to the survey we work with, and we did a comprehensive survey of the entire uh, Camp Perry base, uh, we also developed some standard operating procedures for the National Guard, which would serve as a, a template for um, on-site people to use when they did routine maintenance or repairs or when they actually considered uh, changes to the, to the built environment there. Uh, another favorite project was when they were uh, when the National Guard was decommissioning some property at Fort uh, at the Air Station Borenkin in Puerto Rico. So poor me had to go to Puerto Rico for a couple of weeks and walk around this uh, former uh, Air Force base to document historic buildings there, including airports and uh, you know service service buildings, but uh, a fair amount of housing. Um, some of it was designed under an American designed plan. Um, so that was a that was a good project. Um, I know people, a lot of preservationists and young preservationists in particular, I think, kind of roll their, high, roll their eyes at Section 106. But Section 106, I think, can be really an effective tool for um, to bring something positive about historic impacts or impacts to historic resources. Um, the Department of Homeland Security is installing a, uh, a border system uh, along the Detroit River, and so they plan to put a tower right next to the Marine City Waterworks, and as mitigation for the construction of that tower, uh, we were hired to do some documentation and ultimately to prepare a National Register nomination for the Marine City Waterworks, which is also an engineering landmark in addition to a very sweet um, historic architectural site. Uh, what keeps us busy, I don't know why that's there, what keeps us busy, uh, cell towers. Um, we were working in a historic neighborhood in Michigan. This this is not the historic neighborhood, incidentally, but uh, we were working in a historic community 
uh, and a very large cell tower was proposed. So our job was to do a visual simulation. And this was years ago when the uh, simulation technology wasn't as good as it is right now. But we actually went in and uh, used a, a boom to elevate a flag to the approximate height of the tower and traveled around the radius of this tower to see the extent of visual impacts that we'd con that, that would be experienced with the construction. Um, it was funny because as we were out driving around, we noticed uh, there was some op opposition to this, this cell tower. And as we drove around, we noticed people getting on their cell phones to, you know, to call the neighbors and say, oh, here they are. Um, how, how ironic that was. Uh, wind farms are also a big business. Uh, the first one we did, obviously, uh, not obviously, is in Indiana, northwest Indiana. Um, they're popping up more frequently here in Ohio. But, um, you know, you look at this this rural agricultural landscape and uh, imagine what is the visual impact going to be for the construction of 600-foot uh, wind turbines uh, all around that. So that's that's one task that we uh, that we do. Um, closer to home here in, well, in Columbus uh, is the former Briggs home in Briggsdale, which is on the west side of Columbus. Um, the property is owned by uh, an assisted housing um, entity and they sought to expand their facility and the property they owned was uh, the location of the Briggs home. So as a condition of their HUD funding, they, they did have to consider the impact and the impact of demolition obviously is very adverse. So as a condition of the demolition, uh, we were contracted to uh, do some, uh, a permanent exhibit that's on, on installed now at the Township Hall. Um, but also to do a roadside marker, a state marker. We're going to submit that application soon. So, um, you know, there's losses, but uh, but there are gains as well. I, I think it was a USDA rural development loan, actually, that Heidelberg was using for improvement of some of their uh, dormitories. And so we were hired to do an architectural assessment. Is that is that building... Uh, and I can't recall, I think it's 1964, is that building historically significant and are the activities proposed by Heidelberg uh, negatively impact, uh, impacting the building that might be eligible for the National Register? We had a unique relationship with the city of Detroit. For almost 20 years, Mannequin Smith held a contract to administer their Section 106 program. And we basically had two people, two Mannequin Smith staff people were embedded at the city of Detroit to manage their Section 106 uh, obligations, uh, but we also had somebody serving the Historic District Commission too. Um, so uh, with the, um, Maurice Cox is the new planning director and uh, when the new administration came in, they decided that they would hire the staff themselves. So that contract is no longer ours, but uh, we do continue to have a really strong relationship in Detroit. Um, as a condition of a programmatic agreement with the State Historic Preservation Office and tied to this HUD funding, um, the city was required to develop a training program for staff people uh, to explain what the, how the historic preservation uh, ordinance works, uh, how to process their paperwork, how to uh, coordinate with city staff on, on upcoming projects and so forth. Um, we also worked with the Detroit Housing Commission to do some documentation of a, a luxury hotel and, and um, I think the uptown area, uh, Lee Plaza, which was built in 1927, I think, was a luxury hotel that had fallen into hard, into hard times. It was owned by the Housing Commission. And as a condition, as, under this PA, as a condition of sale or transfer, um, the city was required to put together a a management plan or a strategy for preservation. So we were hired to go in and do documentation of all the remnant historic features. Uh, we worked with an architectural firm too to actually uh, make some recommendations about how to stabilize the building appropriately. Last I heard, I think there's some movement to, to get that building um, uh, redeveloped. So what, what 
what we don't do that's regulatory is um, related to historic tax credits, although obviously we it is heavily regulated, but it's not under Section 106. We do historic tax credits for both state and federal programs. Um, I find that really, really rewarding work. We're not architects, so we don't do the design work, but we do prepare the Part 1, 2, and 3 uh, nominations or uh, applications for tax credits. <clears throat> and occasionally, and, and typically uh, as associated with uh, tax credit projects, we do write national register nominations. Although um, working for an engineering firm and working for, working for a larger company, obviously there's the, the issue of overhead. I'm, I'm paid a small hourly fee and in order to pay for the fleet of vehicles and the large building that we occupy and to cover the non-billable work and you know there's an overhead cost. So it's difficult for Manikin Smith, a firm like Manikin Smith, to compete with small mom and pops or uh, one one person shops. It's hard to compete uh, financially for on national register nominations, particularly for individual property owners and uh, non-investment uh, motivated owners. So uh, the National Register nominations that we write are few and far between, uh, but they're there. And um, I guess that's a sample. Now, Danielle, you and I have been talking about what what lessons might be learned from some of this. Um, I, as I was building this presentation, I was um, thinking in terms of, you know, how has my what, what's the trajectory of my career? Where did I start? What did I need in order to move to the next step? I will say I think I'm not a traditional preservationist uh, in the sense that I haven't taken a very direct path. It's, I've bounced around a lot. Um, as a result, I think I've, I've acquired some sort of unique skills, um, most of which I've been, to, been able to apply, not all of which translate to a dollar-wise, but um, uh, if if I were to offer a recommendation to some someone coming into the profession or someone at a crossroads in their career, I might say that um, the most important thing, obviously, is having the skills. I continue to take um, classes. Um, federal regulations do change. There's a, a National Register program that's coming up tomorrow, uh, hosted by the State Historic Preservation Office, uh, to talk about some changes in how to write a National Register nomination. You know, that's so that's kind of the granddaddy of them all. And hey, hey look, the expectation is changing. Um, I also uh, really encourage people to think about what the related skills are, um, because you never really know where it's going to go. Who would have thought writing a thesis on mobile homes would turn into an internship to develop a program for weatherizing mobile homes? Um, I, and, and a lot of that is being in the right place at the right time, but also recognizing your skills and being able to translate that into a, a project of some kind and to, to um, monetize your, your um, professional skills. I also think it's really important to have relationships, professional relationships, and relationships with people of affiliate interests. Um, when I was working at the State Historic Preservation Office, we put together, um, a, there was a, state, a statewide series of, um, of conferences held on farmland preservation. And I worked with uh, uh, the organizers for that conference. So they were held, I think they were in five locations across the state. The Ohio Preservation Alliance uh, provided some, some startup money for these programs. Um, but we, uh, but I organized a group of people with affiliate interests: the Soil and Water Conservation Districts, uh, the Farm Bureau, um, a couple of other organizations, local organizations, to talk about um, how quickly and and it's an issue in Northwest Ohio that may be more pressing than other parts of the state. But the loss of prime farmland and what that means uh, in terms of our agricultural community and our and our uh, cultural heritage, um, but also it has an impact in cities. So really preservation of 
preservation of um, ag land and, and rural communities is as much about the preservation of urban centers as well. So cultivating those kinds of relationships with affiliate groups, I think, is really important. And um, I think you get more bang for your buck, honestly. Um, those were very successful programs and ultimately I think they're part, I think Greater Ohio is, um, is the is the final incarnation of where that started back in the 90s so um i feel good about you know how how planting a seed in one place can can yield a plant that looks totally unlike what you'd expected but um is nevertheless pretty gratifying At this point, if anybody in the audience uh, has any questions at all, please feel free, go ahead, type those in. Um, Pearl is gonna let me know when they pop up. Um, I have known Maura for, I, I don't wanna date either one of us, but it's been a good minute. Um, <laughs> um, and I gotta tell you, she's one of my favorite people and I thought I knew some things about her, but boy, today has been really enlightening even for me. Um, one of the things that intrigued me early on when you were talking about things, um, you said your dad was an architect in the, the 50s. Mm -hmm. So he would have probably been right at the forefront when the 66 Preservation Act was passed. Mm -hmm. um, and, and you were very young and very impressionable um, as it was being implemented in that first uh, decade after its passage. How did he feel about that? Did Were you aware of it? How did, how did that, influence anything, if at all? Um, I was not aware of that at the time, and I don't think my dad was necessarily on board, although I grew up in a community, well, Chatham Township is right on the edge of the Great Swamp in, in north central Jersey, and there was a proposal at around that time that Newark Airport be constructed in the swamp. So I know that there was a very strong movement against that. Um, it's, it's sort of an environmental um, activity, but um, but I, but that was in our backyard. So it was apparent to my parents. They knew all the players. They they knew the people who were leading the charge against Newark Airport. Ultimately, the Great Swamp was dedicated a park service site and is now one of the most revered natural areas in North Ohio. But um, Funny, I should end up right on the edge of the black swamp here in Ohio. I'm a, I'm a swamp thing. Um, so I, I can't say that my dad was necessarily uh, on board or aware of uh, preservation activities, um, but he was very proud later in his career. He's very proud of the work that I was doing. And I think possibly the learning went the other way. I think my I probably informed my dad's um, opinions or perspectives about historic architecture as much as he influenced me. It doesn't surprise me, um, given your variety of work, that you would um, learn about it yourself. And, and I know you've influenced me. It doesn't surprise me at all that you would influence um, the other people around you. So knowing that you have a, a, a vast, really deep knowledge of things, what's your favorite part? What, what was, if you could pick one element or two elements out and say, boy, I'd love to do this all the time, mm -hmm. what, what would those be? Mm -hmm. Honestly, um, you know, I was community development coordinator. That was the first professional job I had. And the title really says it. I think historic preservation is about community development. Um, if I were doing, <laughs> and, and I really like that interaction with people. I like working on behalf of communities. I do not think I'm telling them the answers. I am helping them achieve the goals that they want. Um, so community-based work, I think, is most gratifying to me personally. Um, but honestly, I don't know how you make a living at that. <laughs> Except working for local government. And as I said, I'm just not temperamentally suited for that. Uh, neither am I, says the community development specialist here <laughs> at CT. <laughs> so, um, 
It's just a title, <laughs> exactly. Um, in, and I really think what you're talking about, it, it speaks to that overlapping um, drive among many things and finding those common interests. I've felt that way about preservation for a long time myself. It's, it's not that preservationists are the only ones that are interested in these things. Um, the Congress for New Urbanism, the Urban Land Institute, all the mm -hmm. new urbanist stuff, Mm -hmm. That really is about preservation as much as preservation is when you think about it. They're talking about reusing spaces. Um, I really think that redevelopment is is the next frontier. Mm -hmm. Takes some pretty smart people to reuse spaces. Mm -hmm. um, so knowing that we are re-embracing, I guess, some of the historic pieces in in our in our communities and things like that. Another thing that you mentioned, um, the historic Route 66 work that you did. Yeah. Um, I've been on pieces of that myself. I'm just curious, when when you were there, um, as to now, have you been back? Have you seen changes? Have they been good or bad? Mm -hmm. Have you talked to anyone about you know, how they're preserving things versus you did? I'm, I'm just mm -hmm. curious. Uh, well, honestly, when I was doing the survey work, they weren't being preserved. What I was documenting was, was ruins. Um, I do have relationships with people back there still who are on the Route 66. Uh, the National Park Service, I think, took, uh, took a field trip or did, has, has been doing work along Route 66. Honestly, I'm not sure what the status of that is. Um, but I understand from friends that, that, that some of those things were they, they could not recover from where they were it was it was mostly a, a case of documenting before it was gone but that's not to say i mean i i live in uh, right through the center of bowling green ohio is the dixie highway and the dixie highway was a major road from michigan down to florida i mean that's another really important road um, and roadside architecture is fascinating to me but the the reality is how do you keep a business going uh, and something that may be architecturally interesting may not necessarily generate enough income to, to support someone. I think that's where um, Heritage Ohio is unique. It brings the economic piece with mm -hmm. the Ohio Main Street program right up next to that preservation mm -hmm. piece mm -hmm. um, with the advocacy work and things that they do. And, you know, I, I, being in the field myself, being in Main Street, um, I've, I've really... I've really come to acquire uh, a perspective that you need to let places breathe over time. Mm -hmm. um, you can't really just fix them in in one space in history. Now, there are places like Drayton Hall, you know, that deserve to be locked into their their period of significance. But um, many other places, if they're going to be vibrant, if they're going to be saved, kind of like the Route 66 places, then they need to be able to change. Don't know that that's necessarily a bad thing. I see the built environment as a as a record of our history. It tells our story, mm -hmm. and our story is still evolving. Mm -hmm. um, but with that in in mind, um, I'm going to ask you a loaded question, and and um, again, I'm going to rely on our friendship that we're just going to have a discussion on this. <laughs> Um, okay, so let me get relaxed. Here. Right, right. <laughs> Take a deep breath. Um, so cell towers, windmills, billboards, yeah. those are modern day developments. Are are they like the railroads and the telephone and telegraph wires yeah. of old that we now think are yeah. very nostalgic? Yeah. Um, it, how do we <laughs> how do we ride that line between <laughs> is this a bad change or is it just a change? Mm -hmm. Is it just old or is it valuable because mm -hmm. it's old mm -hmm. uh, well uh, <laughs> um, uh, well I've laughed with the, the environmental en engineers in my office that have laughed about the fact that there has been a landfill listed in the National Register <laughs> <laughs> um, so so any kind of man-made object uh, has a potential uh, it tells a story and is that a compelling story worth preserving? Um, so, well, I studied mobile homes. Um, there have been, there's at least one mobile home court listed in the National Register. Um, by their nature, they are mobile. So the integrity of setting and place, uh, 
that's kind of a challenging conversation. Um, I think in terms of the infrastructure you're talking about, though, the cell towers and so forth, I personally see this as somewhat ephemeral items. Um, I don't know what happens when a cell tower gets abandoned. Um, I don't know that anyone will be advocating for its preservation. Uh, I also see that it's uh, a little bit of uh, visual clutter that, that I don't find particularly attractive. Um, but the distance of time, I think, makes a difference there. Man, I, I really don't want to be de defending cell towers. <laughs> <laughs> and I am not going to win Friend of the Year Award for putting you on the spot like that. I know I'm not. But I, I do think it's part of the overall conversation, the evolution of preservation. Mm -hmm. You know, in the 60s, when, when all those wonderful people advocated for that act to be passed, you know, they were saving the things that their parents didn't really value because that was what they grew mm -hmm. up with and it wasn't old and it wasn't worth anything. Mm -hmm. It was just old. So I think we've, as a, as a profession, we may have actually now lapped ourselves. Mm -hmm. We may be back to that point of saying, you know, I think there's an appreciation for mid-century mod, mm -hmm. you know, the, I, I had no idea there was a landfill on the national register. I, I personally think that's hysterical. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I know ranch houses are right. being listed right. um, because that's part of our story. Right. But uh, it's it's a it's a fascinating conversation. Mm -hmm. um, so we'll switch now um, to one of the questions from the audience. Um, what do you like being? What do you like about being in a large firm with staff versus being on your own or in a mom and pop? Um, yes, there are pros and cons. Uh, working for a company, I'm not technologically savvy. Uh, and I'm not great with finances. So technologically, I have an IT guy that I can go to on a moment's notice and ask, uh, you know, can, can you do this for me? Um, and produce something that's very professional looking, much better than I could have done myself. Uh, working for a firm, I also have staff. Um, I work with environmental scientists, for instance, and oftentimes there's going to be an overlap between our understanding of uh, what we're seeing out in the world. So I appreciate being able to rub shoulders with coworkers who can share their technical knowledge with me, but also, you know, the, the, the sense of being part of a larger group and uh, getting that kind of uh, working support. Um, obviously, it's a weekly paycheck and I've got a 401k. Um, I'm not personally very responsible that way if i were you know i would be i would be chasing the jobs that i love if i were working for myself and i likely will be soon um i would be chasing jobs that probably would not be paying the bills uh that might change obviously but uh, th th that was my experience to date i was taking projects uh, f f from one to the next um without a long range plan for actually building a um a backlog of work and having enough to keep me paid and comfortable for a year and actually uh, putting money in savings and paying insurance and a liability and workers comp. I mean, the business side of, uh, of running a business just doesn't interest me a great deal, honestly. You said something and it sparked with me. Um, we were talking about the budgets too. And as a mm -hmm. consultant, I know that, mm -hmm. you know, that overhead and not being able to, right. uh, um, to necessarily make projects work with that kind of budget. Mm -hmm. um, when you when you said chasing the projects you love, it it, it just kind of smacked me upside the head. That's what retirement is for, right? <laughs> Isn't that the very definition of retirement? Or retire with dignity. Retire with That's dignity. What I, That's what I'm looking for. <laughs> Perfect. Um, but, but it is true. I mean, uh, the difference between the mom and pop and the large company is that I, I get paid, you know, say $25 an hour, but my billing rate is maybe 125. So a client is paying a hugely, well, let's say, unfair rate, but I mean, the markup is, is large for a firm and it's hard for me to compete on smaller projects that may be more personally rewarding. Um, so that's what I miss. I miss the small projects. On the other hand, you do get to go to Puerto Rico. So. <laughs> Indeed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
So there's that. Uh Um, So knowing and and having you gone through the the Mannequin Smith experience, um, that was that was awesome. So uh, one of the questions I had kind of thought about was what's a typical day look like? Um, Is there a typical day? A typical day. Well, um, I'm I'm I'm. There is I've been approached by a client who uh, wants to pursue a tax credit project. And so we're going to hold a public meeting next week. And this week was spent putting together a flyer and coordinating with the three organizations that are working in their downtown area uh, to be sure that everybody is on board with this and that we're, you know, that we're talking to the right people and not offending anybody or, anybody or leaving somebody out. So it's coordinating uh, meetings for work that hasn't been authorized quite yet. Um, I obviously I have two or three staff people that I have to touch base with on a daily basis. You know, I have to review um, uh, invoices uh, once a month, so that's something that's on my plate right now. Um, there's always the job of marketing. So uh, Mannequin Smith has some, um, every time we finish a project, we have to do a project summary, write something up to describe the work that we've done so that we can sell it to the next client. Um, and then right now, I guess I've got to start work doing, uh, start work on the research for these tax credit projects. So it's really never a dull day. <laughs> it's it's different almost every day. Different every day. Mm-hmm. Um, if there's anyone in the audience that has any questions at all, um, <laughs> let's see, I'm getting one. Okay, in in the 106 process, have you seen the mitigation measures change or evolve over the years? Um, has there really been um, creative mitigation that you were involved with? You know, I think that's a big disappointment. Um, I attended a webinar, or sat in on a webinar a couple of years ago that I think the trust sponsored on creative mitigation. I didn't hear anything much of anything new. Um, you know, the standard mitigation is documentation. And I know that uh, photographs and a report do stand as as a record for, per, for future researchers or, uh, you know. I, I think the project that I mentioned in Briggsdale having some public record, making something more accessible to regular people, not just historians and archivists or preservationists, but making information available to regular people, I think is really important. Um, I did work on a project here in Ohio where there was a large cash uh, donation made uh, for mitigating the project. Uh, which went to the local historical society. And ultimately, I think that's probably going to generate some worthwhile projects um, without the limitations that you might have um, working through the SHPO office. You know, I'm actually bricks and mortar work, which I think is really important. There's few sources of, uh, of funding for that kind of stuff. Um, creative mitigation, I'm still waiting to see it. Yeah, I, I'm still waiting. So speaking of things changing over time, um, at this vantage point, looking back, um, is there anything you would have done different? I, I, I guess we're we're starting to uh, run out of time here. So now I'm I'm switching to a kind of a retrospective or looking forward. Um, is there anything you would have done differently? And then also, how do you see preservation moving into the future? Mm-hmm. Um, what advice would you give young preservationists? Mm-hmm. Uh, the one thing I would have done is get some training in finances. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I really think that, that that's been a disadvantage to me, personally and professionally, both, because I think you could move projects forward better if you had a better understanding of finance. Um, what do I see in the future? Actually, I, I read an interesting article it was a National Trust, it was something from the National Trust Main Street uh, Center, and there was some suggestion that the uh, Secretary of Interior Standards, or the standards for rehabilitation, should be applied, uh, not more loosely, but they're, they're, that preservation should be within everyone's reach. I, that's what I took from it. And her suggestion was that that everyone needs to meet 
the highest possible standard uh, is not reasonable, perhaps, and it discourages people from all walks of life from getting involved in historic preservation. And I think, you know, the Historic Preservation Act was written to ser serve the public interest. So why are we doing this? It's not just because I love old building buildings, it's because I think it's important and I, I want to be the vehicle to help other people um, save the places that have value and meaning to them. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I hope that it continues to be a participatory sort of process and it's not just a, an activity of elitists. Um, that's a little bit of my fear mm -hmm. um, that it gets too rarefied or not within the, the reach of everyone. Um, as for advice, boy, just keep building a career and there's no wasted effort, I don't think. You know, even working in a restaurant for me was useful in helping me understand uh, how to manage time and how to prioritize project and get things, you know, get things lined up so that they work. Um, there's, there's no wasted effort, really. Awesome. Thank you. We did have one more question come in. Um, do you see the National Park Service becoming more restoration oriented in tax credit reviews and more purist in National Register nominations? Uh, more restoration oriented in tax credit reviews. I think they're rigorous and I think it goes to the comment I just made about the, the Main Street manager suggesting that they're the Main Street director, uh, suggesting that there be maybe a tiered system of applying some standards for rehabilitation, um, depending on the quality of the building or, you know, depending on whatever whatever factors that is that, that we decide on. Um, in terms of NR nominations, I, I, have, I have been around for a long time. And those National Register nominations from the 1970s are are really uh, loose. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, just saying something's the best example of something just doesn't cut it anymore. Um, well, it remains to be seen, I guess, at tomorrow's presentation from the Park Service reviewer on what her expectation for standards are. But uh, clearly, um, National Register designation has has it has become terribly professionalized. And um, I'm working with an owner and right now who's trying to write a National Register no, or a historic, I'm working with a historical society member who's writing a National Register district nomination who's been terribly frustrated that through their third review of uh, of her National Register nomination, it just, you know, she can't seem to get on track. Um, and I think that's disappointing. You don't want to disappoint those historical society people who are your advocate or your, your allies um, and advocates for history. So, um, I don't want to see that lost. I don't want to see that relationship lost or that feeling that we all, that this is something that we all share and that we can, can, can contribute to. I think that is a tough balance uh, between wanting to have a really good document um, and, and trying not to burn people out. Right. Um, one of the things that when, when I was learning, and, and honestly, I still get a little bit hung up on, I don't know that I have a, a great answer for, um, when you talk about things like um, the period of significance or the historic significance or what's contributing and what isn't, can you talk a little bit to what those factors are and how you determine those for, for you know, people out there that are maybe listening to say, hey, you know, I wanna get involved, but I don't even, I don't even speak the language. Yeah, it's maybe an intro language into some of the jargon. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. I'm not going to be your friend after this, am I? I hate you. In fact, I've got to leave now. Goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, you know, writing a National Register nomination, actually the State Historic Preservation Office has established a process that, that takes it in small steps, and I think it's actually a pretty good approach, and that is to submit to them a preliminary questionnaire form that uh, provides some basic information about the area that you're looking at, the area you're considering, what period of history does it represent, what's in that historic district or what is that historic building, you know, define exactly what the physical characteristics are, 
um, contributing and non-contributing is uh, would only apply in a historic district, I guess. And if the if in uh, among multiple buildings, um, the contributing resources are the ones that um, meet the integrity threshold and also fall within that period of significance. So, for instance, if you have a commercial district um, that represents the growth of the city of Bowling Green from 1874 to 1912, which was the period of most intense growth associated with the uh, gas and boom era, for instance, um, the boundaries would be selected to chose chose the greatest concentration of historic resources that that tell that story basically um, and uh, determining whether they're contributing or not is based on a physical evaluation of whether they meet the integrity of materials and setting location design feeling association um, those physical characteristics of the building uh, and if it meets the historical threshold as well if it if it as I said tells the story um, so there's a lot of back and forth, especially writing those national register nominations. There's, <laughs> it's not a black and white uh, process, um, uh, but uh, typically the State Historic Preservation Office, the SHPO's in, intent is to uh, help move that forward so that it tells a concise, precise, uh, well-defined story that that's physically represented in the world. Sorry, I'm, I'm not sure that that answers the question. No, it does. Exactly. And and truly, I, I think that that's what binds us more than anything is that story. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Maura and I have, as I said, known each other for quite a long time. We've been on um, the Maumee Valley Heritage Corridor board together. And I think that that, that unified idea of, of telling a story mm -hmm. over time, watching it change, um, figuring out what's important and, and getting that word out, like you said, to the regular mm -hmm. people. Mm -hmm. That's probably, um, that's at the core of what I do as well. Yeah, the irony of this is that uh, the only D I ever got on a high school paper was in history. <laughs> I did not enjoy history. I, I've never had a good head for memorizing dates and history presented in high school was a sequence of battles and you know m memorizing events between between men mm -hmm. and uh i never enjoyed that it's when i got into preservation <laughs> ironically every day i do history i'm i am recreating a story i am using facts to tell a story that is represented in the world with a building or a structure or an artifact of some kind I love that, the, the material culture angle mm -hmm. of it. Um, if there are any more questions from the audience, we'd love to take those now. <coughs> well, seeing none, Maura, I'm, I'm not sure if we missed anything, but did I miss anything? Is there anything else that you wanted to share? <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, actually, yeah. I am a, almost a year out from retirement and uh, we're in the process now of doing a transition plan, and I would be happy to talk to anyone out there who is interested in working in the consulting world. <laughs> I hope I haven't talked you out of it, but <laughs> uh, we, we do have offices in Cleveland, Cincinnati, Columbus, Maumee, and Caddis. Uh, the Cultural Resources Group is basically based out of Maumee. Uh, but uh, we're considering what direction the cultural resources group is going to take right now. We're looking for an architecture historian, obviously, uh, to replace me. Um, if you have any interest, please please feel free to get in touch with me. Uh, send me a resume or ask me some questions if you like. I think that's it for me. Okay, so is the bustling metropolis of Caddis, is that because of the <laughs> oil and gas? Yes, or? it is. Okay, yeah, it is. all right, I wondered. I wondered. Great. Well, 